A very warm welcome to the UNSW Scientia Education Academy Lecture Series, which is a forum for educational thought leadership delivered by the UNSW Scientia Education Fellows. My name is Sarah Madison. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Education and Student Experience here at UNSW, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all to our September Academy Lecture. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the Bidjigal people who are the traditional custodians of the, and first educators actually, of these unceded lands um, that I'm um, on today here at UNSW's Kensington campus. Um, and it's a real privilege for us to work, teach and learn here on Bidjigal country. And I pay my respects to Indigenous elders past and present um, and extend that respect to Indigenous or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who are here with us today and also acknowledge the various lands um, that you're all coming from today. Um, the Scientia Education Academy is the home of about 50 fellows who are appointed from across UNSW's seven faculties, including Canberra. Um, and there is some of our most outstanding educators. They share a real genuine passion to inspire students and are champions of educational excellence through their expertise, vision and their scholarship. And the um, Academy's lecture series aims to raise really important issues about the future of learning and teaching and higher education more broadly and drive high level conversations and collectively work towards global best practice in learning and teaching. Um, and I have to say that seems all the more important um, at this moment in time while government policies are trying to erode our amazing global standing of Australian higher education as it is. Um, commencing in 2018 and running um, throughout the pandemic years, the Academy's lecture series has reached about 3,000 people. Um, the lectures are recorded and shared on the education website, um, which I think the team will drop into the chat for you all. Um, for further reach. Um, and today the Scientia Education Academy is really delighted to host Professor Phil Dawson, who's joining us from Deakin University, and he'll be speaking about improving feedback and developing um, student feedback literacy, which is an incredibly important topic. And we all know that feedback is a critical part of the learning process, and yet it really is pretty tricky to give and indeed receive um, honest, constructive and effective feedback. So we'll um, hear from Phil. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, the um, Scientia Education Academy Deputy Director, Professor Alberto Motto, will introduce Phil in a moment. Um, Phil will present for us for about 40 minutes or so, and I encourage all of you to really join the conversation and participate in the lecture today by posting any comments that you've got in the chat function of Zoom at any time during the present and we'll keep an eye on those. Um, and also post your questions in the Q&A function, which can be any time throughout the presentation. And I'll pick those up at the end of the um, session and we'll have a bit of a Q&A. Um, and please note that the, the session is being recorded and will be available after the event. So over to you, Alberto. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Sarah. Uh, and hello, everyone. It's, it's really a special pleasure for me to introduce Phil today. This isn't the first time we have had the pleasure of hosting him here at UNSW in 2022. Phil delivered a fantastic keynote at our education festival, so check it out if you have a moment. Phil is the co-director of the Center for Research in Assessment and Digital uh, Learning, or, or CRADLE, uh, at Deakin and is well known for his research on feedback, cheating, artificial intelligence, and uh, with, with a focus on assessments. Phil's work um, has been making waves in higher education and for good reason. He is highly cited and ranks at the very, very top uh, globally in the field. And his work uh, you know, has been featured on ABC TV, The Australian Financial Times, and, and many more. Today, I'm excited to welcome him back for uh, his talk on improving feedback and developing student feedback literacy. He's currently leading uh, an ARC, an Australian Research Council project, uh, focused just on this topic. So there is a lot cooking and uh, interesting things coming up soon, I'm sure. Last but not least, very, very close to my heart at this part, He's also producing an improv comedy show in Melbourne called The Peer Review. The next event is September 12th, so I want to use this to do cross-marketing for this. And the title is just too good not to, for me not to mention it, The Stupidity Paradox of Working in University. Uh, if you are in Melbourne, lucky you. Uh, go, go check it out. It's something I would love to attend myself as improved comedy. It's a bit of a secret passion of mine, and it shapes the way I think about uh, teaching large classes. There is a, a record turnout today, so without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Mike to uh, to Phil. Sorry. 
Uh, thank you so much, Alberto, Sarah, UNSW for hosting me here. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on. So that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations down here in Nam, in a southeastern Melbourne. And uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and becoming and acknowledge that there's a, a rich tradition of, of feedback in Indigenous education as well. So I'm going to share some slides, okay, and you'll all shout and whatever if, if you can't get access to those. So yeah, I'm, I'm Phil, I'm from Cradle at Deakin. Um, this is a talk that's really a mixture of some older feedback stuff from a, a previous project, Feedback for Learning, which you can see uh, one of our little cartoons we made from that, or Simon Kneebone made. He's a, an Australian political cartoonist. Um, and also some sort of more recent work on feedback literacy as well. So two big ideas. Uh, you'll see my Twitter slash X there if you want to sort of tweet these or whatever. Um, but I want to quickly get started with three things I'd love you to take from this Prezo. So firstly... There's been a shift in what we think of as effective feedback. Um, feedback has changed. Uh, and we'll go into that. Secondly, I want to talk about what feedback literate students do. We'll go into what feedback literacy is. And thirdly, what feedback literate educators do. But I want to start with a question for you. And this question is, what are the problems with feedback? Could you chuck into the chat what you think the problems with feedback are? What are they in your world? All right, we are we are rapidly seeing things. Defensiveness, uh, ambiguous, time, student attention, it's too vague, unspoken expectations, quality and timing. Yeah, there's there's a lot here. There are a lot of problems with feedback. Uh, disparity between educators and students, there's some more timing issues, um, people not knowing how to provide effective feedback, uh, being too general, students not reading it, students lacking feedback literacy. No, I, I think we're seeing some things that are on the provision end and some things that are on the receiving end here. Uh, you know, problems with the feedback message and problems with, you know, students lacking the capability or motivation or, or whatever to actually make good use of it. Yeah, I've got to mention there of students not reading the feedback and the literature certainly supports that. If you have the ability to go into your learning management system and find out, are students actually using the feedback that we provide? Are they even accessing it? I encourage you to do so. When people do that, they sometimes find a majority of students don't ever access the feedback on the learning management system. We have some things around closing loops and providing opportunities for students to make use of it. Um, we have some workload related things around time to provide useful feedback. We have an impact question of how do we know if it really works? Um, we have students saying they don't get any feedback. And this one's fascinating. There is a sometimes a, a mismatch between what teachers think they do, what teachers actually do, and what, what students think is happening. And uh, Jan Orrell's work, I would say, is a really great example of going in there and trying to find out um, uh, what do educators say they do and then what do they actually do? And there's sometimes even a, just a mismatch between what we think we do and what we actually do. And then, you know, students on the other end sometimes think, oh, I never get any feedback, but they ignore all the conversations that we have in class where we talk about, you know, their work or their views or whatever and how it compares to some standard. We've got the time it takes, uh, opportunity to try again, um, specificity and overgeneralizing, which is probably an issue we have really broadly in, in education. But I can say we did a, a survey of 5,000 students across two universities on feedback. And one of the things that they said they wanted that they weren't getting was personalized feedback. 
And we're like, what on earth does personalized feedback mean? It just kept coming up in the, the survey. So we ran some focus groups on top of it. And to them, personalized feedback just meant, I want to feel like someone read my actual work. Um, but, you know, some challenges there around generic feedback can be pretty good, but people also want to have personal feedback on their work. Uh, volume of feedback, being criticism, yeah. Um, I, I really like this one about the end loading of feedback. So we sometimes do feedback practices where we say, okay, let's have a look at the assessment. Now we have a beginning close to the start of semester, 20% task. And the final task is a, say a 60% task. And we've got some other stuff in between. So we'll do most of our feedback work on the final 60% task and really minimal on the first 20%. But that is end loading the feedback. That's providing those feedback comments at a point where they're least likely to have any immediate effect. You can argue they'll use it in the next class that they take, but that's really optimistic given what we know about students using feedback. It's more likely they're going to make use of that earlier feedback to improve immediate work than some sort of vague connection from a final task to later work. So, so I would really encourage to do what you need to justify the grade in those final tasks, but don't spend all your feedback resources there because it is always about resourcing, isn't it? Uh, workload is a zero sum game. Anything that we want to do that's new, we have to replace something else or we're losing our weekends or our evenings or our time with family. And I, I don't think that should be the answer to the feedback question. We have so, so, so many other things in there. Um, I'm doing a real quick scroll. Um, managing expectations is interesting. Uh, students often come from other education sectors where there's different feedback practices and trying to get them to be okay with what we do in higher ed, which is sometimes a bit dismal, uh, can be part of becoming accustomed to what, what we do. Um, but also managing expectations in terms of we are going to be critical about your work and that might be challenging for you. Um, we have universities not paying for us to do feedback properly. Yep, I'm going to agree with you there. Uh, however, something that's really interesting is, so th there's a kind of a standard thing across Australian unis, it seems, which is about one hour per student per unit module subject in terms of overall assessment and feedback workload. That seems vaguely standard. That may or may not be where you are. I was chatting with someone at a place that has twice the workload for academics and all the complaints were exactly the same. So doubling the workload didn't solve the problem of feedback there. I'm not saying double the feedback workload wouldn't be a good thing. Uh, promote me to vice chancellor. I will try and find a way to make that happen. Uh, if that's at all possible, but I don't think it solves all the problems of feedback. And my gosh, we have so much in there. I think this chat is going to be really valuable for, for people to look at. Um, I'm going to move on to one that I think is a really nice way to look at this. It addresses kind of a lot of parts of this. And this is a quote by Dylan William that Feedback should be more work for the recipient than it is for the donor. And if you take one thing away from this talk, let it be that. For me, it's a really powerful mind shift going from feedback's all about what I do and the way to solve feedback is for me to spend more time on it, to be some sort of hero that provides more and more of my life to my students, to... No, no, the goal of feedback is ultimately that students do something with it. So the goal is actually to make work for students. The goal is for students to come away from feedback with work of learning to do. And that's the sort of mind shift that I'd, I'd love us to have and take forward in this. Really a focus on what students do. So... There's been this kind of shift in what we think of as, as effective feedback in recent years. And 
it's shifted sort of from a, an old view that we sort of load up the feedback cannon and blast it out there into the world. Uh, and, and our job is done, that our job is just that. And, and also this is a great, another great Simon Kneebone cartoon. As an aside, if you are writing a grant application, I strongly encourage you to find a way to include a line item for a cartoonist or someone else that can help you visualize and communicate the ideas. All of these cartoons came from Simon just hanging out with us for a day during a project meeting. We didn't talk with him, but he just kind of watched us and observed, what, what are we talking about? Um, so back, back to the content, there has been this shift in what we think of as effective feedback to this view that feedback is something different. Feedback is a process in which learners make sense of information about their performance and use it to enhance the quality of their work or learning strategies. Now, this is a, this is a shift. This is a redefinition of something that we may feel we all have a common dictionary definition understanding of. And let me, let me unpack this a bit. You don't have to buy into this definition, but I'd love you to understand it. So we're starting by saying it's a process. So it's not just an artifact or something that's sent to someone. It's a, a process in which learners, so we're, we're saying it's a thing learners do, they make sense of information. So sense making, trying to understand this various inputs that they get. They may be contradictory inputs about their performance so it's got to be anchored to something. It's not about them. It's about their performance and use it. So here using it is necessary to enhance the quality of their work or their learning strategies. So this is saying it might be in the short term, the immediate work, it might be the long-term work, or it might be the stuff that sits above that, the learning strategies stuff. And certainly that sort of feedback at the self-regulation level from uh, John Hattie's meta-analysis work seems to be where we might want to focus more of our efforts in feedback. Now, this is a redefinition of a word we all use. You don't have to buy into it, but I'd love it if you are willing to come with me on a journey where we say what learners do in feedback matters a lot. Certainly what we do as educators matters, but what learners do really matters. If a learner gets some wonderful feedback comments and does nothing with it or never even checks the learning management system. There's no feedback under this definition. Uh, but even if you don't buy into the definition, there's still a problem. So we we want to shift to a real focus on what learners do. Um, and there's some interesting comments in the chat about sort of what students want. So students just want us to tell them what's wrong. Uh, they don't want to be prompted to think further. And that is interesting, isn't it? I have real concerns about uh, a lot of feedback with large language models at the moment, because those are really designed for maximum engagement, maximum user retention. So they'll give you what you want. They will give you, you know, here's how to do it better. Here's the comments. Here's what you should be doing instead of what you're currently doing. And I, I worry there might be a sort of, acceptance of that without learning. You know, you have students sometimes in, in doctoral supervision where you send them all these track changes uh, comments and maybe some changes and they just go, accept changes, accept all changes, bang, job's done. And there's no feedback in terms of learning there. There's change to the work, but there's not learning. So there's real, real concerns there. Um, and there's a mention there of feedback literacy, which we, of course, are going to get to. Now, this is all part of a shift from good feedback to effective feedback. So we might think, I provide good feedback. And you very well may provide good feedback. And providing good feedback comments is a good thing to do. But I want us to focus on effective feedback. And effective feedback has to have effects. So it's kind of defined a bit tautologically here. Um, but I want us to focus our efforts there. So shifting away from I want to provide as good feedback comments to students as I can to I want to create feedback processes that are effective, that lead to change, that lead to effects. And in that view, there's no feedback or certainly no effective feedback here. I left feedback on their final essays, which they never collected. Um, 
I am old enough that this is what feedback tended to look like early in my academic career, sitting in my office uncollected. And I would sometimes think to myself, my gosh, that's that represents a wasted weekend. There's what what's the educational use for this? I understand the policy says I've got to comment on every student's bit of work, but they haven't got it. They haven't picked it up. So there's no feedback here. And this is very much part of a, a shift from an old paradigm of feedback to a new paradigm. In this new paradigm view, and I'm using Winston and Carlos's ideas there, um, feedback's an active learner-centered process. And would really encourage you to have a look at that book by Winston and Carlos. It's probably the most practical of the feedback books that are out there. So that's the shift. There has been a shift in what we think of as effective feedback. And now a real focus on that effective feedback. Um, I'm noticing in the, the chat an interesting example about using a Padlet activity for students to reflect on feedback they've received and how they'll use it to improve their next submission. I think these sort of exercises are, are really useful to provide scaffolding for students about how they're supposed to do that. Because uh, we expect a lot of students in the feedback process, but if we don't provide those supports to make it easier, it's, it's, it's a big ask. Uh, we've got some conversation there about students' cultural backgrounds influencing how we define effective feedback as well. And I really agree with you there. Uh, I have a doctoral student, Angan Kisworo, who is working on feedback in intercultural doctoral supervision. And he, he's really noticing that there's a lot of oh, things that supervisors might think are good feedback practices but for their particular doctoral students, they aren't just ineffective feedback practices. They might even be harmful or hurtful feedback practices. So culture really does matter there. Um, yeah, space on the cover sheet. That's an excellent one. I love the idea of using assignment cover sheets as one of these scaffolds for feedback engagement there. And there is a little bit of a literature around on that. I think Naomi Winston's done some work on that as well. Um, well, we've got some talk about coaching and yeah, that's, I think it's really interesting to look at coaching and seeing what can be used from there. Um, all right. I'm going to, I'm going to get cracking because we've got to talk about what feedback literate students do. Okay. I have a question for you, which is what should students do when they receive feedback information? Would love your answers to that one in the chat. So what should they do? This is ideal world. Right. Stop, think, reflect, reflect. We we have a fair bit of reflect. I think, yeah, reflection really matters. Um, read it. Send chocolates. I'd love some chocolates. Uh, incorporate, implement, uh, critically engage, analyze, come up with a plan and steps. That That's really good. That's quite sophisticated. Um Updating their assessment after reading the comment. Yeah, yeah, make changes. Do things differently. Uh, critique the feedback. Is it valid? I think that's really important. Too often we view the ideal student practice in feedback as doing everything we say, and it's not. I think people that are good with receiving feedback aren't people that just do what everybody says. Um We've got some stuff on picking one or two points and responding to them as part of the assignment. Yeah. Uh, reading, incorporating, making plans. Um, seeing your learning as a continuous quality improvement process. Yeah. There's an orientation to it as well. Yeah. Um, being open. That's interesting too. And in some of our work on feedback literacy, we've also administered a big five um, instrument as well, which includes a uh, subscale in it around openness. And we do find that openness is associated with certain good feedback behaviors. So yeah, really agree on that one. Um, what else? Learn from the feedback, how to better interpret and meet assignment instructions in the future. Yeah. Future learning, not just the immediate task. Uh, there's some emotion. So assess or process their emotional response. That's really interesting too. Um, I think that kind of 
uh, self-regulation around emotions and that kind of meta level of how am I feeling about this, not just the feeling. Feedback before grade, yes. Uh, and there's stuff we can do there as well. So there is some work on what if we provide the students with the feedback comments first and then wait a couple of weeks and then give them the grade. Are they more likely to engage with the feedback comments? And yes, they they are. Um, choosing what to use. Yeah, don't use everything. And ask questions. Yes. Okay, so so this is a lot. And I have another question for you, which is... What do you do? So this is you. This is not the ideal you. This is what do you personally do when you receive feedback information? Could be grant assessor, could be student feedback about your teaching. Um, you can keep it in within the work context or not. I It was mentioned I do improv comedy. What I do in the improv comedy space when I get feedback is sadly not as sophisticated as when I get feedback in the work context. Oh, we've got a lot. Okay, who it is? How long? Yeah, well, we've got cry. Yes, we do have cry. Uh, I've cried. I think probably a lot of us have cried from feedback. Let it sit and marinate. Yeah, yeah. Look for the actionable bits. Self-reflect. Take it personally. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel that. Uh, assess the validity and usefulness of the feedback. I try to do that. I don't know how good I am at it, but I certainly try. Read, critique, ask about anything you're not clear with, try and understand it. Uh, pose, read, absorb, reflect, action. Chad, could you expand on that one? That sounds pretty interesting. Um, evaluate, redraft, uh, say thank you. Yeah, yeah, there is a... a a part of it that like someone has spent some time caring for you to provide this hopefully useful information. And we might want to thank someone for, for doing that. Identify weaknesses, work on them. I, I like this feel sad, step back, go back to it again. I like a walk around the block in a few days for a, a grant proposal. Um, I saw, no, no, it wasn't I saw. I was having a chat with uh, Gavin Brown recently, who's a, a well-respected assessment researcher, and he was talking about a time recently when he sent one of his students some feedback, and they he accompanied this quite critical feedback with, you're going to want to get a bottle of wine and have a night after you read this and then spend a week being mad at me about it and then come back and and then let let's do something with it. Uh, yeah, you know, possibly maladaptive strategies there, but there is, you know, there's a place for time and there's a there's a place for sort of emotional regulation in there. Uh, we we have so much good stuff in here. So, and there's also a mention of a drink there as well. Uh, heaps of different things. I want us to shift onto this important question, which is probably the most important one of all for feedback literacy. How did you learn to act in this way? There were some great things on there. How did you learn them? Making mistakes. Yeah. Failure, experience, trial and error, five stages of grief. That's interesting. Uh, observation of effective strategies. Yeah. Learn from supervisors. I had the benefit of a PhD supervisor who said to me, first time you get feedback on a subject you're teaching on your own, I want you to come sit down with me and we'll go through the feedback comments. And we did that. And it was amazing. Uh, he really helped me to understand which of the feedback comments that were quite critical and hurtful, I might just want to disregard because that's just a normal comment students make every semester about classes, you know, but this one over here, this, this might really be an indication of something you might want to work on. Uh, and I don't think we do enough of that modeling and supporting for uh, particularly academics on how to work with student feedback comments. We've got growing up. Yeah. Uh, our family processes and what we do in our families. We've got natural response based on parenting feedback. Oh gosh, we have so much in here. Now there's some disciplinary stuff as well. 
Yeah, the, the journalism one. It's never the first draft, it's the 20th. And I think if we look at how feedback's dealt with in our disciplines, it can be quite instructive. Uh, professional practice does involve having to work with feedback. Okay, tons and tons of things here. I have to cut it off because I am not managing time well at all. So please forgive me. Uh, I want to pitch a concept to you, which is just the stuff we've been talking about. It's feedback literacy, the understandings, capacities, and dispositions needed to make sense of information and use it to enhance work or learning strategies. So it's the capability to do the feedback thing on the, the receiving end largely, but also on the providing end. This is a really simple model from Carlos and Bad. It has appreciating feedback, you know, that connoisseurship of feedback, though it could also include the thank you that was mentioned earlier. Making judgments, which bits of this feedback are credible, which bits are useful, which bits do I think I might use. Managing affect, so working with emotions through the process. And I think if they were to redo this now, they might have something more like making productive use of emotions uh, because, you know, we don't want to view emotions as something we have to tamp down in the feedback process and, and get rid of. Emotions can be a powerful positive force in feedback as well. And that's not just positive emotions, uh, negative activating emotions. So negative emotions that motivate you to do things, which can mean like, oh, gee, it, I, I am embarrassed that, I gave you work of that quality. I am not going to give you work of that quality the next time. I'm going to do better. And similarly, positive emotions can also be deactivating that kind of pride of, oh, I'm wonderful. This feedback makes me feel great. I'm not going to do anything. So we need to move beyond a simplistic view of emotions in feedback to also think of activating and deactivating. And maybe someone could put into the chat a link to Pekrun's, that's P-E-K-R-U-N, Pekrun's work on uh, emotions there as well uh, and taking action because ultimately that's what we want doing something with the feedback and we've done some work on measuring feedback literacy as well so if you are thinking this feedback literacy thing is good but i don't know what where my students are at uh, have a look at our instrument the feedback literacy behavior scale because it's a way to measure what students do in feedback and are students doing things that are along that line of feedback literacy. It's free, it's open access, we have an online version of it. Um, we're even happy to administer the online version on your behalf and give you like a summary report on your students if you have more than, I think it's a couple of hundred students complete it. We can give you sort of a, a summary report from your students and we've got details on how to get to that on our website, or you can just grab the instrument and administer it yourself if you want. So yeah, that's feedback literacy. That's what feedback literate students do. And also some great reflection on what we do. And I think this sort of chat log is a beautiful mine of some effective strategies and also some things we do just to get by. Now I want to talk about what feedback literate educators do. So Oh, I just also want to attend to, uh, there's a comment there, huge gap in the managing the affect of feedback in literature. And yes, there absolutely is. Um, I really wish there was more literature to build on there. It's one of those ones where I, as an education researcher, um, don't feel as qualified to kind of wade into that terrain. However, on our ARC discovery project, it's half psychologists. And we are working with people who are doing that. Um, but yeah, if, if you have any good references to some some work, uh, and Jamil also says they're working on their thesis on that. So maybe you could share some of your work if you have anything to share too. Okay. What do feedback literate educators do? I want to jump to one little aside first. And I want to say that it's not just providing better feedback comments because that's not necessarily going to improve student feedback literacy. If we view developing student feedback literacy as a goal, providing better comments isn't always the way to do that because we want students to be able to work with feedback in any context, maybe even contexts where the feedback is not particularly helpful or even hurtful feedback. 
and giving students kinder, better feedback comments won't necessarily improve that capability. I'm not saying we want to be hurtful or mean or unhelpful to students, but it doesn't completely solve the feedback literacy problem. I've also got a pick of the feedback sandwich there as well. There's a lot of debate on the feedback sandwich in the literature and among feedback researchers. I'm of the view that it's not actually a helpful way to do feedback. Uh, people seem to understand the ritual and know when they are being feedback sandwiched. I'm sure you've felt like you were being feedback sandwiched before. You know, someone's saying the nice thing. I know the not nice thing's coming up soon. And when they're saying the not nice thing, oh, I know they're going to say a nice thing after this. And some students don't know which part's the real part. Sometimes they go, oh, they hated my work. They only ever said nasty things about it because they just focus in on that bit. Or, oh, they mostly said good things. I think the work was okay. But I encourage you, if you want to sort of delve into the feedback sandwich literature, go out there. It's interesting. But I'm meh, not so keen. I think we want to really focus on how your work compares to the standard and be kind of honest with that. Now, I and uh, Dave, Dave Bowden and I published a paper a little while ago, a year or two ago, I don't have a date there, uh, about what feedback literate teachers do. So we went to two large Australian data sets of educators talking about their assessment and feedback practices. And we analysed those for feedback practices that were indicative of this sort of idea of teacher feedback literacy. We developed a competency framework. The whole thing's open access. You can grab it. You can check it. Um, I think the competency framework is useful if you're preparing something like um, uh, HEA fellowship, advanced HE fellowship, that, that sort of thing, because it can provide a bit of a structure to say, hey, I'm doing these things that are associated with good feedback practice. Uh, but it's also a useful way for us to think about, oh, what, what stuff are we doing? We, we identified 19 competencies across three levels. So 19 sort of teacher feedback competencies across some quite high level stuff. So some program design and development work, um, some meso level stuff. So that's at the level of the course module unit, the design, the implementation, but not uh, that, that was kind of distinct from this micro level, which was, you know, what we do when we're working with an individual student assignment. Often we tend to focus on the micro when it comes to feedback and trying to improve feedback. The micro, if you want to complain about workload and I can't do feedback well because of the workload issues, that sits at the micro level. Uh, that's the stuff that scales at a linear level, you know, for 10 more, 10 times as many students, it takes 10 times as much work. The stuff at this meso level is much more scalable. If you invest there, you can find things that are workload neutral or even better. So I'd love to focus at that level. So I'm not going to be talking about here's what you should write on someone's assignment because changes at that level are not as scalable. And they're also the stuff that we go to first. I want us to think about this meso level. I'm going to focus on some of these competencies in particular today. Uh, you don't have to read that in detail, but um, if you go to the paper, these are the ones that we've focused on today. Uh, so they are maximizing effects of limited opportunities for feedback, organizing the timing, location, sequencing of feedback events, designing for feedback dialogues and cycles, designing to intentionally prompt student action, and designing feedback processes that involve peers and others. Before I go into three concrete practices from my teaching, I want to kind of give you some things to think about when you're doing this work of feedback design. Firstly, to focus less on what the teacher says and focus more on what the student does. If you're familiar with the classic John Biggs 1999 learning is what the student does paper, it's basically that argument, but applied to feedback. It's saying students are ultimately the ones that do the learning. So we want to focus our efforts on things that will influence what they do. We want to stop focusing so much on what we as teachers do. So this is really privileging learning design around feedback. We want to view feedback as a teaching and learning activity. And 
that means you can do it in class. You can spend class time on feedback. We want to build assessment sequences that incorporate feedback loops. So that's sort of, if you're thinking, oh, I'm designing a new course module unit, what might I want to keep in mind? I'd love it if you keep that in mind as you do that work. So here's three concrete practices from my teaching that are supported by the feedback research. Firstly, build feedback seeking in. There was some great comments in there about um, using an assignment cover sheet. And one use for an assignment cover sheet can be to get students to ask specific feedback questions. So require students when they submit their work to make feedback requests. Um, you can go as far in some contexts as saying your work is not complete unless you make a feedback request. It's part of the task. Secondly, making student self-assessment mandatory. So if you do an assignment with me, I use rubrics, you self-assess on a copy of a rubric of the rubric before you submit your work. I assess on a separate copy of the rubric and I compare your self-assessment with my assessment and I give detailed comments where our judgment differs because I really want to develop your understanding of quality, your evaluative judgment. And thirdly, spend class time on feedback. I will usually devote a week or two of class to having peer feedback conversations in class. Get students to sit down with each other and talk about their work. Now, often students come to class and realize they aren't haven't done enough of the work to actually have a chat about it. And that's an educative process in and of itself. But I don't let that stop me from doing this effective practice. And people pretty quickly learn that in Phil's class, you will need to do this peer feedback thing. Now, there's a comment there. There usually isn't enough time to spend class time on feedback. I think that's a mindset. I think feedback is a pedagogical activity. Feedback is a strategy that we use in our teaching. Feedback isn't a content area of its own. Feedback is a teaching and learning activity we use just like anything else. And I would argue that feedback is more effective than PowerPoint and lecture um, or student class presentations. So I think it's a bit of a mindset shift there. The comment there, language used in rubrics might not be understood by students. I totally agree. I tend to provide like a, a video where I walk through all the little boxes of the rubric and talk about that. There's a comment, what about larger classes of 900 or 1,000? I would refer you to a paper by Jacqueline Broadbent, uh, something like la teaching large classes, summative with a formative flavor or something. Uh, that's about teaching thousands of students and using some practices that are pretty similar to these. Um, anyway, I, I should finish off so we can have a proper chat. I want to end with a few suggestions. Uh, the first one is focus more on effective feedback and less on good feedback. Secondly, more effort on the feedback design and less on the feedback comments. So more on what are the systems and structures and feedback loops that are going to happen so that it is more work for the student. And then be okay about spending less time yourself. Focus on what students do in feedback. Require them to make requests, generate feedback. Share what we do in our feedback practices. And there's been some great sharing in the chat and a couple of links there as well. And finally, I just want to end on this slide, uh, which is a mention of that survey. If you're so interested, you can go and fill out that feedback literacy behavior scale yourself. The scale provides some feedback comments to you about your feedback literacy and some things you might be able to improve. Um, and it's also the one that you can consider using with your own students and get in touch if you'd like to discuss how we might be able to help you with that. So yeah, that that's me. I'd love it if someone could just uh, copy that link into the chat if someone's able to do that. So that I, I will unshare these slides and would love to have a chat with you. Oh, that was fantastic, Phil. Thank you so much. Um, really engaging. You're obviously um, practicing what you're preaching here um, and getting all of us to participate, which was wonderful. Um, and you also provided some really fantastic, obviously, research-backed um, tangible tips and suggestions for all of us. 
Um, I do invite people to ask a few questions. We've got a question in the chat here or in the Q&A section from Tristan, and it maybe goes to some of the comments we saw in the chat, which was um, whether you think class time on feedback is best done in student groups or as a whole class. Yeah, I've done this in a few ways. So I've done this as whole class discussion, you know, you can talk about, say, here's the generic feedback across all of the assignments. I've done that in sort of mid-sized classes of just a few hundred students. You can have some sort of dialogue there. Um, but I tend to find it works best at that kind of tutorial seminar level where we get students, you know, have a chat with the teacher, have a chat with each other. I've also done it where I give people an agenda to run their own peer groups. So here's basically an agenda. You do need to nominate someone as the facilitator, but I'd like you as the students to go away and, and run this group yourself. With more mature students, I've had some success with that, but I'd have concerns about doing it with sort of first year undergrads. Yeah, sure. So really giving the students that agency to kind of run with it, which sounds fabulous. Yeah, no, I think agency is a great word here. We want to develop graduates really who have that agency to go out into the world and do great things with feedback. We don't want to develop sort of teacher dependent students who go into the workplace and find that their manager is not going to sit down with them and give them feedback all the time. They just got to do the work. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read the next long question, but while I do that, um, if you want to maybe give some tips around when you do have really large classes, I mean, maybe that is backed onto what you just said, but, you know, what what are some of the techniques? Because we do have a few staff here at UNSW who do have sort of, you know, a, thousand, a class of a thousand. Yeah. So I think there's some work to do in professional development for tutors there, if you're working in really large classes. And again, I'd point to Jacqueline Broadbent's work. So, you know, she invests in developing tutors. She developed like a manual for her tutors on how to do feedback. She built structures in place so that they all did audio feedback on every student's piece of work. And then the tutors got audio feedback on their audio feedback. So sort of had some quality control in there. Um, but I think, you know, that, that stuff is quite uh, resource intensive. Mm. That though audio feedback does actually tend to not be as resource intensive as actually writing out feedback. I'd really point again to the design stuff. You know, if you do practices like telling students, you've got to self-assess and then I assess and my comments are on where our judgment differs. That means I'm spending less expensive marker time on providing comments, but it's comments people actually want. If they're making feedback requests, giving them the comments that they actually want, want and need there rather than a current practice, which is just to tell people stuff we hope they're going to find useful. There's a lot of waste in that sort of practice. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Jamil's got a question here. It says, you mentioned that we should be focused on feedback design and feedback loops. How can we integrate teaching and equipping students to self-regulate their emotions surrounding the feedback so that the uptake of the feedback and therefore the students making meaning of it is more effective and powerful? Yeah, so there's a few ways. Um, I'm really partial to Margaret Bierman and Liz Malloy's idea of intellectual candor, or they used to call it intellectual streaking, uh, but they found that that did not track well outside of Australia. <laughs> they, have, they have papers published with that title and it's now only ever intellectual candor. Um, that is the idea that we as educators should actually open up to our students and say, hey, got some really hard peer reviewer comments this week uh, and it, it hurt me. And here's what I'm doing to kind of, you know, work with my emotions in this process. So that that's one way. Another way can be to explicitly teach some approaches. So, you know, one approach that I explicitly teach is rewriting. I get feedback comments. They hurt. Every time I look at them, I feel bad. I rewrite those into a list of to-dos for myself. When I look at the to-dos, they're in my words, they're positive, they're things I want to do. Yeah. And I don't look at the mean stuff anymore, but I've developed this process to help me regulate my emotions. Um, so I think there's uh, the intellectual candor, great approach and scaffolding supports explicit instruction. Mm, the, 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 I think the idea of sort of sharing how you respond to your own peer review has got a double-edged 
no, not edge, but double positive because we know that students really want to hear why do you, what do you love about the discipline? So it's also a way to kind of bring in your own research in the discipline as well, while also teaching that feedback approach, which is great. Absolutely. Um, David Callis and I and one of his uh, Hong Kong University colleagues did a paper on uh, authentic feedback, which is this idea that we might want to try and represent the feedback practices of our disciplines within what we do in education. And I think that can be quite powerful, actually showing in our disciplines, we we deal with feedback and let's try and prepare you so that when you graduate, you can engage in those feedback practices as well. And I think modelling could be part of that too. Yeah, great. Um, we've got another question. Have you had a chance to look at how feedback would work out in a culture of saving face and what strategies there are to implement feedback effectively in this context? Look, only enough to know that I don't know enough about it. Um, and yeah, if if my if my Indonesian student Angan were here, I think a comment he would make as well is sort of culture. There's big culture, but there's also small culture. Mm. Uh, he he's commented that, you know, the comments from a student um, from Jakarta. And, and how a student from Jakarta deals with, with feedback seems to be very different to how a student from a small town in Indonesia deals with feedback, even though they're both notionally part of this Indonesian culture. Mm. It's, it's a very large culture. And I think we wouldn't want to overgeneralize too much about culture. But yeah, so th this is just me saying I know enough to say that I don't know enough. So it's a research project in the boil yeah. there. And what about would you would you go to the extent of or maybe it wouldn't work? Have you tried then sort of discussing with students in your class how they do take on the feedback to kind of get some of that conversation going of students' responses, or or is that kind of too personal and confronting to do in a class setting? Look, you can give that a go. Um, the extent to which you know, if if the concern is a, a loss of face. Um, the extent to which someone might feel free and, and open to talk about that. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how open people are going to be about that. Um, you know, and we have culture, but there's many other uh, types of diversity involved as well. You know, um, some neurodivergent people experience rejection sensitive dysphoria where, you know, those critical comments hit really hard and for a really long time and can result in disengagement. So there's a lot of diversity that, that we want to consider. With the thing about sort of um, cultures where there's a concern of loss of face, I would also point to a huge amount of feedback research coming out from Chinese universities as well. And a lot of that is specifically around feedback and uh, Chinese students. So really great research from China. Great. Thank you. Um, Maria said that for final exams, we don't have time to give the feedback. Um, so could forward feedback be an effective strategy? Um, and this would be based on their previous work or results in the in the term. Do you have thoughts about that? All right. Um, in as much as I am uh, legally entitled to do so, I want to give you permission to not do anything in feedback apart from justify the grade on a final exam or on some final task and really to reinvest your efforts earlier in the semester. Stop for final tasks trying to do this helpful feedback thing because it just doesn't have anywhere to land. But spend that resource in a place where it really can and we will get better results that way. Great. Thank you. Um, do you see overall, uh, this is from Elise, uh, overall value in teaching students to do peer feedback or is there a high time investment for low return? Oh, it's actually from Sharon. It's the question. Uh, it's funny, funny you should be asking that. Um, we run a thing at Cradle called the Cradle Development Partners, which is for Deakin Academics. And we had a meeting of it this morning where we were working on how are we going to implement some stuff to try and develop student capability to provide useful feedback comments. There's not a lot in the literature around that. There's heaps of stuff about feedback literacy in general and all the benefits of providing feedback comments for the feedback provider. But how do we make the feedback comments useful? There's just less on that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there's value in it. Um, I don't have a lot of sort of guidance to give on what exactly that should look like. Um, 
yeah, but certainly some some value in it. And I think it's dangerous that we too often just say, hey, go and give comments on your peers' work and we don't provide support and scaffolding. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Shoshana has also asked about, you know, that it's worth exploring how neurodivergent educators can also identify and adopt best feedback mechanisms given their own different um, mannerisms and some people come across very differently when writing than orally. Have you got any um, sort of research or suggestions on that one? I don't have any research on this. I only have experiences talking with neurodivergent educators. Um, to to a degree, sometimes this can be a process of, of masking and trying to replicate a, a neurodivergent way of doing feedback, uh, sorry, a neurotypical way of doing feedback to try and present as if you are, you know, engaging in all this stuff and engaging in all the rituals that neurotypical people seem to think are so important. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's it's big and and complex and i think it'd be great for it'd be great for neurodivergent staff to get more support in general but i think feedback's such a sticky one with so many opportunities for hurt and misunderstanding that yeah it, it would be really good to do more on that great topic for research for someone yeah great maybe i'll see if we can squeeze in one more question but i appreciate it's one minute to go so maybe i shouldn't um uh ah, go for it need to jump off they can um so this one's come from alex that different disciplines um often say that they've kind of got signature pedagogies and has cradle research identified any sort of signature feedback approaches by disciplines um and if so does that sort of inhibit change um that's a really fascinating one. I think so. Th there is a there was a special issue of a journal. I believe it was edited by Ed Pitt. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think on signature feedback practices in disciplines, and it was viewed as a positive thing in that uh, special issue. The idea of signature feedback practices, the work we've done on authentic feedback. I I view authentic feedback as a pretty good thing to do. We do want to replicate the world of feedback outside the university in the uni. So we prepare students for it, but we don't want to go all the way in first semester because some of the sorts of feedback practices people will encounter in their first year of graduate employment, they are absolutely not prepared for at the start of first year. So we want to provide that support and scaffolding aspects of the signature practice, but not the whole thing. So that by the end of the degree, we're actually you know, doing the code review or doing the story pitch in journalism or doing the crit in architecture, we're doing that without the scaffolds by the end. And if we can't do that by the end, we haven't prepared students adequately. Fantastic. All right, we better stop there. I'm not sure if Roberto wants to come back and do a bit of a wrap up, but on behalf of all of us here, thank you so much, Phil. That was really sensational. Over to you, Roberto. Thanks. Thank you so much, Phil. Nothing to add. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Sarah, also for uh, moderating. Thank you so much. It was great. Well, thank you both so much. And thank you, everyone, for a really genuine conversation. I've really enjoyed this. Thanks, folks. Have a great hour.